Okay. The following interview was conducted with Jerome M. Goldman, Jerry, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, March 12, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Tell us about where you were born and your parents and early years. First of all, I, I consider it an, an honor to have been asked anything about my past. Uh, some of it that I mentioned may even be the truth. Uh, okay. But if you are interested in where I came from, uh, I was born and raised in Camden, New Jersey. And if you know anything about Camden, New Jersey, you know that you want to get out of there for sure. So I decided that I would go to the university after I well, graduated. Well, tell about your early years. You go to school there and I, you have any brothers I, I or sisters? I finished high school, Camden High School, and uh, decided I wanted to take engineering. So naturally, I applied to Georgia Tech and uh, NYU and uh, Michigan State and so forth and uh, sent my applications in and my mother asked me why I didn't talk to a friend of the families who was going to a school out in Indiana called Purdue and so I did he was a sophomore and he talked Purdue from beginning to end and so I applied to Purdue for engineering. And uh, I was accepted, and I canceled my other applications. So I arrived here. What year was this you came to Purdue? This was the fall of 1940. Graduated from high school in February of 40. I arrived here in the fall of 1940 to take aeronautical engineering. That turned out to be a little bit of a problem because the university did not offer a degree in aeronautical engineering. They offered mechanical engineering with an option for aeronautics. Well, I was here, so that's the way we started out. Uh, next big significant, uh, that was a four-year program, of course, and uh, there was a date called December the 7th, 1941. I was a sophomore uh, at that point in, in the fraternity house uh, on a Sunday morning when when we had Pearl Harbor. That changed things a little bit. The university changed, we changed. And Can you uh, tell us how, what changes took place? Well, as a result of, of, of the, us being in the, in the war now, uh, education was important, military was important, and so forth. So that uh, we now went to school for three semesters a year, which made a four-year degree take three years. Okay, now I'm in that group. Um, ROTC was required uh, for two years, and, uh, but I didn't want to be in the field artillery. So... Uh, at the end of 42, uh, I would have gotten out of ROTC, uh, and, uh, and so I decided that I would enlist before that happened. So Jul July 9th, I believe July 9th, 1942, I went downtown and enlisted in the Army Air Corps. Uh, I didn't get called up until 43, and uh, there was a little bit of a delay, uh, and uh, I tried to stay and finish school then, but uh, the Army said that they, I had already been delayed enough, so I, I departed here in 43. Uh, turns out that... Uh, the university finally decided to give a degree in aeronautical engineering. And the first class to receive that degree, and I have a, I have a certificate on hanging on a wall at home <laughs> that, that mentions the it fact verifies. that I was in a, verifies that I was in the first class to receive a degree in aeronautical engineering, though I didn't get it, and I was in the service by that time. 
And uh, so the next thing that happened is the uh, war ended, and I was I was in the Pacific on Saipan and Guam, flying B-29s, and uh, came back in the spring of '46. Got out of the service and returned to school. Uh, I didn't have very much to go, so uh, uh, I took a few extra courses and and so forth, and uh, received my degree in February of '47. Okay, now tell us a little bit how, about the campus when you first came and how it had changed when you came back. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> When I first went to school here, and uh, and the war, even though the war was on, but uh, even before that, uh, I can't be sure, and I'm probably not correct, but I have a figure in my mind of the total population of the school was six thousand. Uh, Those some, are approximate numbers. Some of I've the heard things that I remember uh, may not be exactly true. But anyway, about 6,000. I don't know how many there were when I came back to school, but I can tell you this. There was no place to sleep on the campus. Fraternities were full. Uh, uh, the, the dormitories, were; those that we had were full and so forth. And I ended up with a, an apartment over top of some stores at 6th and, 6th and Columbia in town. And I had a roommate. My roommate was a ex German prisoner of war. He was shot down over Germany, and uh, he was looking for a place to to uh, sleep as well. And so we we were in an apartment upstairs on Columbia Street uh, at six, and that is because the, the population was so heavy. I, I, the GI Bill, of course, was was valid. And uh, that was nice. I did get to finish school on the GI Bill. Uh, uh, before that, uh, it, it was a little... I was paying the bill, but uh, I have to tell you that t tuition for was $54 per semester, $75 for out-of-state fee, for $128, if my arithmetic is right, per semester, or 250-some dollars per year. Um, I waited tables uh, in the fraternity house that was for my food, and I had a, I did drafting for Dr. Levy, uh, uh, Roy, J. Roy Levy, I guess. Uh, I did drafting for him. He was uh, involved in a housing project up in Gary or someplace, and uh, I did the drawings for the, for the uh, floor plans of the, of the rooms and that sort of thing for him. Uh, his office was in the, what was then the education building, and uh, I had a little office in there where I did my drawing and so forth, and I, and I worked downtown in a grocery store. I worked a, a whole weekend and I got the good money. I got five dollars, and so uh, the GI Bill did look awfully good. Mm -hmm. At any rate, uh, now you you finished. You got your degree. I got my degree February of '47. Now I was, then I was teaching flying while I was uh, going to school, and uh, I noticed that the, now that the war was over, there were a lot of airplanes parked all over the country. DC-3, C-47s, actually a military version of a DC-3, and uh, they were all over, and uh, and I felt like uh, since the university was teaching uh, flying and teaching for uh, profession, professional flying, professional pilots, that uh, we ought to have an airline, and uh, I approached the university administration with this on that subject because these airplanes could be picked up for, for practically nothing. I mean, almost for flying them away, you could have them. And so we could start an airline with, uh, with ec war, war wearies, we call them, war weary airplanes. Well, the university not only laughed, but uh, they, uh, they, they 
they were not very gracious even about it, about saying no. No airline, we're not going to have an airline. And what was my rationale? Well, I thought that, and I got the idea from the fact that uh, some universities have a hospital and they teach in a, in a school called the medical school and they, uh, they operate a hospital for the students. And uh, I thought that if, if you're going to teach students, uh, the, there ought to be some means of applying the, the education. Well, the university didn't share my feelings. So I left in 48 and I went to work for United Airlines. And uh, so... Uh, as a pilot? As a pilot, yes. And uh, I was in New York and uh, we had just built a house and, and, and so forth. And about 1953, um, my old boss, who was then Grove Webster here at the university, came and visited us in New York and announced that the house that we had was have no trouble selling it. And I said, well, I don't want to sell it. I just built it, you know. He said, well, we're going to do what you want to do. And we're going to start an airline, and you've got to come back. Well, we lived in that house 10 months. I sold the house, and I can still remember that I made $600 on the sale of the house. And $600 was just about what it took to, to move me, lock, stock, and barrel, from New York to back to Lafayette. So we came back to Lafayette in 53. And uh, so now... Uh, I was involved in getting an airline started. That's the whole purpose of my having come back. Na and the name of it, and then go the on from there. It, well, actually, uh, the way it was was we had a corporation called Purdue Research Foundation on the campus, which was the the way that uh, things were financially handled. Uh, with the university didn't get their hands dirty with money; uh, it was all state money. So uh, the Research Foundation was a means of uh, buying and selling what we had to do. Then we had another corporation that was formed as a part of, kind of a branch from uh, Purdue Research Foundation called Purdue Aeronautics Corporation. And the Purdue Aeronautics Corporation then was the, was the means of starting the airline financially. Uh, and uh, <coughs> we, we did do that. And uh, we got an airline started. Uh, uh, we had DC-3s. We cleaned out Eastern Airlines' fleet of airplanes in Florida. And we, we started with about four airplanes, which was about their last of their DC-3s. We started an airline. And we, the university and, and, uh, and uh, Purdue Airlines Corporation, doing business as Purdue Airlines, doing business with Purdue Airlines. Uh, we, we had an academic uh, environment to teach pilots to be airline pilots uh, and give them a degree. So a fellow could get a degree uh, in airline piloting. Uh, now, uh, the university did not offer a four-year degree at the time. It was a two-year degree. Uh, and... Uh, the students accepted it, I guess, for the most part, uh, with an associate degree. And I had students that went to probably uh, every airline in existence got one of my students sooner or later, and uh, one here and one there and so forth. Uh, was this, uh, excuse me, this uh, Purdue Aeronautics, was it primarily for training of the, the students for an educational? Was that, so it wasn't doing any, you know, it was non-commercial and there weren't any leased flights or anything of that sort? You couldn't uh, charter? You couldn't charter? No, no, okay. The airline, the income what was it, uh, from the air, for the airline, the income was that it was a charter airline. Okay. Uh, there was no schedule. But it also was for, for students to oh, get uh, experience? Students were flying in the airplane. Okay. Uh, they had to learn how to fly. Uh, we had a flight training program. That Purdue Aeronautics Corporation did not do the teaching of the flying for, for their pilot certificate. Uh, the, the university uh, uh, had a pro flight program that teach students how to fly. 
they had to have uh, a I can't remember whether they had to have a commercial or not but they had to have an instrument rating and I think a commercial as well and then uh, they uh, came from one building to another out the airport and uh, and now they were uh, going to school uh, and, and, and flying at the same time uh, Purdue Air Nautics Corporation was responsible for part of the academics. Uh, I taught meteorology, for instance, and, and also uh, uh, airline airline operations was a course that I taught. And uh, it was teaching a student how to be an airline pilot. And of course, uh, uh, we really uh, we got our fax machine in that. The, the maps, the weather maps came in off the fax machine, and we had a weather department, an operations and a weather department, and uh, the students uh, learned about weather and meteorology and flying and so forth, and they affectionately called uh, the course map terrology because the students were assigned uh, responsibility for taking the maps off and putting them on the counter like you have in a weather bureau, and, and uh, we have the teleprinter. The, the teleprinter was the uh, uh, means of getting the, the text messages and so forth. So we, we ran an airline, and uh, now, but we had to have money. And uh, uh, like I said, uh, the, the, the airline operated by carrying passengers. What kind of passengers? Oh, how about. Uh, Chicago White Sox, uh, how about uh, the Columbus Jets, uh, 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 AAA cl club uh, who, who was in the International League and, and uh, we used to fly, fly in the International League charter and that, that would have been uh, Toronto, uh, Syracuse, Richmond, Miami and Havana and uh, we, we used to Batista was uh, the leader in Nevada at that time. So we used to fly the teams and the Chicago White Sox, we had one of the airplanes painted. By this time we had gotten DC-6s, I forgot to mention that. We now moved into the DC-6 business, the, the four engine airplane. And uh, we painted one of them white, Chicago White Sox and uh, we carried Chicago White Sox uh, all over the uh, that, that's the American League. And uh, so we were earning our way, excepting that uh, I, I guess I was unhappy with the f events that they kept us flying propeller airplanes. And, uh, and I said to Grove, my boss, we've got to get jets. Oh, that was another big joke, you know, get jets, you know. Well, I pursued that f to, to where I was always in trouble, I guess. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, I succeeded in, uh, in, in selling the idea that we needed. If we were going to teach airline pilots, we have to teach them on equipment that they're going to fly for the airline that they're going to go to work on. And that argument was valid, apparently. Now, where do you get the money to buy the jets? Uh, DC-9s were $4.3 million a piece at that time, $4.3 million a piece. And we're going to need a couple of them. So uh, it turns out that <coughs> Fred Hofty, <coughs> excuse me, Fred Hofty, uh, who is a uh, terrific, terrific guy and an uh, advocate, aviation oriented, and so forth. And, and uh, I, it was a pleasure to, absolutely a pleasure to be around him and fly him to, and so forth. And uh, and he was a good friend. Fred Hofty had a good friend in the <coughs> investment, the bond business, one of the largest bond businesses in the country, is Jack Stevens and Company in Little Rock, Arkansas. And they play golf, Jack and Fred. And Fred's telling Jack that we need, we need 
DC-9s, and we need DC-9s. I don't know where we're going to get the money. We're not making enough money, and we can't use any state money for it or anything like that. And Jack says, hey, I'll, I'll give you the money. I'll give you the money. I'll take stock. Now, here's a stock company. 100% of the stock is owned. The Purdue Iron Ores Corporation is the stock, and the university owns 100% of it. So now Jack Stevens takes stock in this corporation. And we bought airplanes, DC-9s. And uh, uh, I got to uh, get them and go out to, <coughs> out to uh, Long Beach and bring them home. Uh, at that time, uh, it was interesting. There was another airplane uh, going down the uh, line, assembly line, all near ours. It was painted black all over. And it had a bunny on the tail. Uh, it was a Playboy airplane. So we ended up then by uh, buying these DC-9s. They were all paid for because uh, Jack gave us the money. You know? And uh, let's see if I can jump ahead a little bit now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I skipped over a period of time which was very significant. You now see how we got an airline going. Uh, but uh, Fred Ogden was also involved in another org an organization being formed called Midwest Program for Airborne Television Instruction, which is MPATI. And that was, MPATI was made up of uh, the universities and colleges in the Midwest. Uh, including uh, Michigan and Ohio and, and us and so forth, and corporations uh, like Ford Foundation, for instance, and so forth. And uh, it seems like uh, there was a little experiment carried on uh, with television, uh, televising from an airplane in Pittsburgh by Westinghouse Air Arm Division and a fellow named Chili Nobles, who said, we ought to get into this business of broadcasting athletic events from an airplane. We can, there wasn't networks, there were no networks that I know of at the time. And what he was experimenting with airborne television, televising, uh, you, you, the, the ground station transmits, the airplane picks it up, and an airplane uh, transmits it into a, a multi-state area. But he was having trouble with technical problems and this and that and, and so forth. And so, and, 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 and Patty then, the organization that would do all this, uh, had to have a place to sit in the, an office and when a means for money and the usual problems. And, and Fred Hubby said, we'll do it. We'll do it at Purdue. And that'll be headquarters for it in Patty, Purdue. And we'll get the airplanes and we'll do all this. Well, where are we going to get the money? Well, there's a little outfit called Ford Foundation in Detroit. Mr. Ford, I don't know if it's Mr. Ford or not, but uh, anyway, Ford Foundation subsidized this. And it was about, and I, and I could be wrong, but as I recall, uh, the first initial offering from Ford was about $7 million. They put up the money. And uh, they had some restrictions on it and so forth, of which I, at this point, can't remember even. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Purdue was the, uh, we were going to operate it. And so we needed airplanes. And we scouted around and found two DC-6AB, a standing for cargo and B for passenger, A, B airplanes owned by Slick Airways, which is a car, was a cargo operator out of uh, Burbank, California. Uh, you've heard of the Flying Tigers. Well, Slick was a competitor to the Flying Tigers, and they used to fly from San Francisco to Tokyo with these airplanes, and they had extra tanks in them, and they had a lot of fuel. And what we needed was a lot of fuel to stay up in the air a long time. We bought those airplanes. 
I wish I could remember uh, how much they were, but uh, they were there were no problem with the money we had. We bought those two airplanes. Now, well, what we got is two empty airplanes. We need a television station on here. Westinghouse Air Arm Division and, and their, their aviation uh, department it was at Baltimore National Airport and uh, they were putting radar and so forth in military fighter planes and they did a lot of radar work and a lot of electronic work and so forth and uh, they were one of the corporations that was involved anyway and so they said they would equip the airplanes uh, to be television stations channel 72 and 76 two UHF stations were put aboard the airplanes you know, I w uh, was involved in the flight testing of them because there was a lot of things had to be done. These airplanes had no means of generating power for electronic electricity and power for the broadcast. Uh, so they had to have a, a turbine generator in, in the tail. Later, later airplanes have it. They come out of the factory that way. But the DC-6 did not have it. So we had to do that. So we had to design that. And uh, I wish I could remember the fellow's name now that was with Westinghouse, uh, who was the engineer in charge of all of this. And he and I had a few words together because uh, he was not an aviator. Uh, he was uh, a uh, electronics uh, genius, in, in, so to speak. But he was involved in speaking to uh, equipping the airplane. <coughs> so, okay. He installed the turbines, and now uh, there's another source of power to television called klystron tube. Klystron tube. They are <coughs> uh, they weigh probably about a ton or or more, and uh, we had to have one for each station. So there's one on each side of the airplane, inside, but they generate heat, so they got to be cooled. So now there's a jacket around them. And then right outside the air, airplane are air coolers. And so we circulate the, 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 uh, oh, the f fluid uh, for uh, cooling, cooling fluid. Uh, like in a radiator of your car. Uh, your Freon. Freon, yeah. And that then had to be cooled because it picked up the heat from the cholesterol tube so that we'd run outside the airplane, go through an airborne cooler. We had these big coolers on each side of the airplane, one for each uh, channel. And we had two uh, stations in the back, two engineers in the back uh, uh, transmitting. And now uh, what are we going to transmit? Well, uh, we had, uh, and Patty brought teachers from all over the country here the best from all over and they made tapes here and uh, the subject matter was, was, was broad uh, I mean we uh, foreign languages uh, chemistry physics uh, mathematics all being taught all on tape and being transmitted for the level of high school or, or grade school oh, oh grade school okay. well I take that back. I don't know. Uh, okay. I, I don't know but whether it was restricted, but I, what I do know is we tell we got into a five-state area. Okay, now ridiculous, but uh, <coughs> they charged. They had to set up a charge, of course, for this, and it was a dollar per year per student in the schools, and it, and it would be television receive, receive sets in, in, in the schoolrooms. But it, it turns out that uh, well, it was very successful technically. That the, the the educational value, the education uh, was was terrific. I mean, there, there's no question about it. And uh, we televised about uh, eight hours a day. Uh, well, eight hour a day plus the flight time. We're getting up there and back down. We found a discreet place to 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 make figure eights, and then uh, uh, we we stayed on one spot. Uh, uh, in a figure eight while we were transmitting and uh, uh, and education was fine and everything was fine and dandy except for one thing 
the costs were far in ex excess of what they were charging. So Ford again came through with another little gift, but said, this is it, this is it, you get no more money. So we had to make it. Well, now they tried to uh, increase the price to to just It wasn't. It was the. It, it was the, not statewide. It was uh, individual schools, not not school systems even. Some schools in in the sy school system would have it, and some, some wouldn't. Would. It, it, uh, it was really. Uh, they did a very poor job, of selling it and. And it was arranging not, it. not by district, but by individual school. Within individual schools. Now that brought us in contact with the individual teachers. And I, I hate to say it, uh, uh, teacher, but uh, teachers were suspicious of the system because uh, because here we were. Uh, it was math. Uh, the math teachers had, had they had a syllabus to go with it, of course took about five minutes or seven minutes to introduce the program, then sat down, and the rest of the program was, uh, I don't know how long it was, half an hour or 45 minutes or something like that. But anyway, uh, the teacher would sit down, and then when the program was over, the teacher would get up and dismiss the class. Well, that looked to me like uh, that uh, they were very unhappy thinking that they were being put out of business. Teachers thought that the the here this is the coming thing television this is new you know television's new and uh, that's that's going to be doing all the teaching in the future there won't be any need for any teachers okay so that's we the success was uh, technical success was, was established but the financial capabilities uh, was going down 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 so now we did this for eight years. And uh, now, aviation-wise, technically-wise, we had two airplanes equipped. It took about a year to get them equipped mm -hmm. like this and do the flight testing. And uh, I remember we did the flight testing in Baltimore uh, over just the, the uh, flight test area for, for the Navy, the Navy flight test area for Patuxent. Is, the area is over Chesapeake Bay. And that's where I'm over there flying, uh, the test flying. You know, with the, we had a lot of problems with the installation, and a uh, few arguments with a uh, few people. Uh, uh, but at any rate, uh, I'm over there flying this airplane, and uh, looking down at the Chesapeake Bay, and uh, my very good friend and roommate at Purdue, uh, a fellow named Mari Bernhardt. Uh, was an aeronautical engineering student as well, and so forth, and he graduated. And uh, he went in the Navy during the war and came back, and then he went to work for the FAA as a flight test engineer, and he, and he is now test flying Glenn L. Martin's airplane. They're designing a, uh, a, a jet seaplane, Glenn Martin. They're out of business now. Uh, a a jet-powered seaplane. There were none, and uh, and this is early uh, in design of jet airplanes. And Mari is doing the flight testing, and he complained to Glenn Martin that every time he applied power, the airplane would dive instead of climbing. Well, Glenn Martin examined all the details of the design of the controls and so forth, and never did find anything, couldn't find anything, and uh, Mari went back to testing the second airplane or the second testing job, whatever, and uh, you apply power and the airplane dives. Well, that's not, that's contrary to aerodynamic procedure. It was a climb. Uh, and at any rate, Mari dove into Chesapeake Bay and died. And uh, that was the end of that subject. Uh, uh, the second airplane was tested by another test pilot who I can't remember whether he got killed or not, but uh, he confirmed the fact that the airplane would dive. Well, that was characteristic of, uh, of uh, jet airplanes with jet wings as you apply power. Uh, but what would happen is that the, uh, uh, the center of pressure, uh, my 
uh, the right words don't come out sometimes. The center of pressure on the wound move aft on the wing as you apply the power and so forth. And as, you, as it moved aft on the wing, it lifted the back end of the wing and the airplane went down. Now we know that. We know that. Uh, but uh, Not at those days. Not at those, sure. Right, yeah. Okay, so anyway, we did the test flying an airplane, we put it to work, and then now we're, uh, we had a hangar built here. Hangar number four that was built for the Patty airplanes, uh, for these two DC-6s. And uh, for, to be reliable, uh, what we did was we had uh, a crew on the ground waiting uh, to go fly if the first airplane got in any kind of trouble, which from time to time uh, we would lose an engine or something of sort. We would stay up there drifting down as, as best we could uh, until the other airplane came up and took over. And uh, that, that business that presented a little problem because we wanted to be as high as we could naturally for, to get the range of the transmission, so we were shooting for 23,000 feet, which the, uh, that's a, almost that's a halfway joke, you know. Uh, we were taking the airplane above it, its uh, performance capability when it's loaded down with fuel and, and the tapes, uh, the equipment and, and so forth, and, and the tapes and, and the fuel uh, made it hard for us to get our altitude. But it, we did it, and it took us about 45 to 50 minutes to go out of Lafayette and, and get to Montpelier, Indiana, which is just about 28 miles south of Fort Wayne, <laughs> you know, know. Yeah, and right. we did a fleet. There was no nothing there in the way of uh, 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 radio facilities, excepting we were using Fort Wayne's, Fort Wayne's uh, navigation facility, and um, we were able to, with, with what's called DME, distance measuring equipment in the airplane, we were able to relocate ele electronically the Fort Wayne station 28 miles south and 5 west or something, as I recall. So now we had a cathode ray tube sitting in, in, right in front of us, uh, like a radar set, but mm -hmm. it, it, what it was, was uh, it was us and, and, uh, and the center of it being Montpelier. And we did figure eights because if you did all, uh, if we did all uh, holding pattern uh, uh, ovals, uh, we would accumulate uh, gyroscopic errors, errors in the gyroscopes, gyroscopes. So we had, what we did was we made alternate right, right and left turns, alternate right and left turns with a figure eight, and that would offset the cumulative error uh, of, of uh, making tur all turns constantly, because we, we made, I think we were doing uh, 10 or 15 mile uh, distances from the center or something like that. And incidentally, one of the other things we did in connection with, uh, with this uh, televising uh, in Patty was the Weather Bureau heard about us and said, well, you know, we need information, weather information, you know, and, and weather information moves, you know, and so it keeps changing and so forth. What we need is a, a weather station and stays in one place at, at altitude. And so we were elected. So we, about once an hour, we would give a weather report to the Weather Bureau of what we found, because uh, uh, we, were, we were sampling it right there, you know. Well, to make a long story short, we, I guess we did that for about eight years. Oh, oh well, we carried two days' tapes, uh, the, what they were using, and tomorrow's tape on board the airplane. And the reason for that was we, all, we trained and always, I think there was only, in eight years, there was two times we did not go. And the reason for it was the runways were so icy and slippery that we couldn't stay on the ground long enough to get off the ground. Uh, but outside of that, uh, we went zero, zero. Uh, we, we trained uh, with the hood up and so forth. So we, we went. Now, how do you, well, we can't, you can't guarantee you're going to get home. So at the end of the transmission day, 
we had to go somewhere else once in a while because we couldn't get back into Lafayette. So we'd go to Louisville or, or Columbus or, mm -hmm. or someplace like that. And then we would originate the next day, instead of leaving Lafayette in the morning to go on station, we'd leave from wherever we, we had landed. So really, uh, we, we did a good job uh, uh, as far as the uh, reliability is concerned. And the quality of the education, it was good. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was just no question about it. So now, what happened? What happened? Okay, well, I'll, let me, now let me go back now to where I left off, running an airline. What, what happened, uh, Mapati, why did it, did the funding ran out? Is that why it had to be terminated? And, yep, and Patty ran out of money and they couldn't raise it. They couldn't get any success at raising it. And uh, they just uh, went out of business. Sure, I understand. And, uh, <coughs> and that was about eight years. That's pretty good. Give or take a little bit. I don't did know. Did you do uh, uh, one question? Yeah. In, was it the summer or just during a school year? Oh, no. Uh, all during the year. Yeah. Mm. All during the year. So they'd I have think some. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, there are some things in the summer, too, I imagine. I think. I, I don't remember. Right. Well, I don't remember. There may have been some, but yeah. primarily would be during the school year. Yeah. Well, the, the, well there's another problem. Uh, we had an operational problem. And in, in uh, hot weather, the performance of the engines is poorer, and we're having trouble getting our altitude as it is. And uh, so I'm not so sure that we did it in the summer. Maybe we did. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Okay. Back to Purdue Air All right. Now, uh, so, so that, that was the end of fiscally uh, and financially. That was the end of Impati. Uh Okay, now, uh, I guess I was, uh, <coughs> I'm trying to think of, we were operating the airline, and... Uh, and you're doing charters. And that was our source of income, sure. charters. All kinds of, and... Uh, Did you do the Purdue teams? Oh, 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 uh, absolutely. That was my job, because I got to go to all the games. Football and basketball, right? Both. Yeah, okay. different airplanes, you see, and um, yeah, oh yeah, uh, well, we used to fly people like Red Mackey, and uh, you know, and, and uh, Molenkopf, and uh, these are all, of, that, this is the athletic department as far as that I know, you know, and uh, uh, Bob Greasy, Bob Greasy, yeah, Leroy Keys. Leroy Keys. Well, he's he's here on the campus now, you know, and uh, oh, but uh, th it was it was a fun job for me, and uh, then that then of course oh, squeezed in there somewhere. Uh, Mr. Hefner was going to have an airplane, uh, and uh, Hugh Hefner is the founder of Playboy. Right, Mr. Hefner is a is Mr. Playboy. He still is today. And uh, he happens to use the same uh, agent, our, our aviation insurance. Uh, well, the agent was a fellow named Bill something or other, I can't remember his last name, from up in Wisconsin. And, uh, and he handled all of our aviation insurance. And he also happened to handle Mr. Hefner's insurance. So uh, Mr. Hefner said, I want an airline to operate my airplane, but I don't want any big airline. So Bill 